you. I'm, um, yes, I'm Roger Niebuhr, and I'm Professor of Surgical Education at Imperial College London, and I'm also uh, a Wellcome Trust Engagement Fellow, and I'll explain a bit more about that as, uh, as time goes on. So um, it's a great honour to be invited to give this penny lecture, and it's, it's also a great pleasure because my, my late father, uh, for many, many years, attended, attended lots of classes here at Morley College. <coughs> And I think one of the things he valued the most was Morley's open-mindedness, its creativity, the, the opportunity to, to explore areas that he just hadn't thought of before in an environment which was supportive um, and exciting. And it's those, it's those values that I want to explore in my lecture this evening. And, and what I want to put to you in a nutshell is a, is a model of education and learning that that subscribes to those values, that, that looks outwards, that is about, about connection, about thinking widely, and about working with people, which I think runs, runs pretty much counter to a lot of things that are going on in education at the moment today, where it's all about looking inwards, it's about fragmentation, it's about being driven by short-term targets and outputs and things like that. And I think I'm, I'm going to argue for something completely different. I'm going to argue for a different way of looking at the world, a different way of learning. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to um, use as a, as a core of my argument the world of surgery. I'm going to start by giving you a, an insider's view of, of surgery. Um, I'm going to then suggest to you that we might frame surgery as, as also a craft and as a performance, and that by doing that, different things come into view. I'm going to talk about how we might make connections between the normally closed world of surgery and other worlds through simulation, and I'll explain when we get there what I mean by simulation and how I've been using it. Um, I'm going to, towards the end of my talk, looking at, look at how it might be possible to capture the wisdom of people now quite elderly who've seen a different world uh, and, and seen that morph into the one that we're in at the moment, um, and end by, by looking at how we might reframe learning for how things work today. Um, but before I go any further, can, can you hear all right at the back? Is, am I standing near enough to the microphone and things like that? So, so my thesis here, really, is that looking outwards from what we think we know can change what we see, particularly if we then look in the other direction at our own world through different eyes. So I'm going to start by explaining um, the world of surgery that I come from, and I, I, I put this, this health warning there because I, I need to show some pictures of what surgery is like. So I hope if anybody feels at all squeamish or, or unhappy about that, you'll bear with me. My intention is not in any way to offend or to be gratuitously unpleasant or anything like that, but I do want to, to give you a sense, those of you who are not surgeons um, or clinicians perhaps, of what that world is like because I'm going to use that to widen my argument, so please bear with me. So, um, my first career was as a, a surgeon myself. This is uh, the 1980s, that's me over there, uh, doing a large operation in a hospital in Soweto on the outskirts of Johannesburg. I was working in Southern Africa in Namibia for quite a long time, um, dealing with people who had been uh, injured. Most of them had been, had been stabbed or, or shot. Now, I'm not doing that anymore, but people are still getting stabbed and shot. Um, and this is the kind of thing that you might see if you um, are working in a hospital today, a casualty department. And when that happens, um, they don't seem to have any sound, actually. Ah, oh, there we are. Um, I'll just go back. Yes, OK. So we're looking here. If we could have a little bit of sound. Um, who knows? Uh, at, at an operation which is taking place, and so we have a surgeon, uh, we, we have a, a connection between the surgeon's hands and the instrument she's using and the material she's working with the patient's body, the intestines and things that you can see there. Um, and although we can't hear what she's saying for some reason, um, we can see what she's doing, and that's the important thing. Um, now, surgery is not a, it's not a thing you do on your own. You're always doing it with other people, and so if we look in more detail, at a, at a glimpse of an operation, we can see that we've got several people whose hands are involved all at the same time in a, in a beautifully choreographed, highly coordinated way of, of integrating 
those, those movements. We've got a kind of ballet of hands. And if you, if you are a surgeon yourself, you kind of learn how to do this by doing it. Nobody says, you're going to learn the ballet of hands today, and here's how you do it. But they, they tell you off if you get it wrong. And by picking up how things are in the group of people you're working with, you learn how to do it. Um, now, you, you can learn how to do simple things, but there are all sorts of things that, that you can only learn by being part of it yourself and by doing it. Because a lot of what surgery involves, as I think almost any other craft or performance, a lot of the really important stuff you can't put into words. And I'm going to show you a brief clip now. Um, we're looking here at a, a very experienced surgeon, and he's, he's teaching an inexperienced surgeon an operation to remove the gallbladder. And we're going to get to the point where he's explaining one particular part of what you do to, 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 to peel the gallbladder uh, off the liver. So if you just listen to, to, to what he says. You could get the sound fixed because it's actually um, not working. Could you ask him to come in and Okay, so I'll, I'll translate because uh, what, what is happening here with, with, uh, in this clip, and it's much better in his voice than it is in mine, but I'll tell you anyway, um, is that he's, he's explaining how to do this operation. And, and when he gets to the point of... Um, sorry, when he gets to the point... Of, of, of doing this part, of showing what happens when, when, when you separate these tissues, he says... He says, here, here, there's this really useful, interesting thing you, you need to do here. You put your finger in there, and you feel the... Um, and then he stops. And he stops, because I think he's reached the limits of what language will allow him to convey. He's, he, he needs to show something, and he can show it. And the person he's teaching can put his finger in there and feel the... Um, <laughs> but you can't put it into words. It's not in textbooks, it's not in journals. It's not something that you can tell somebody over the phone. It's something that you have to be there yourself and understand it with your own fingers. And I think that, that he has put his finger on all sorts of things, and one of them is the, the, the crucial importance of being able to convey knowledge in different ways from the ways the system normally privileges. So I thought I'd start by just, just explaining a bit about how, um, well, how I learned about anatomy and surgery and things. So you start off, well, when you're at school, you might see a picture like this, and a picture like this is quite helpful in some ways because it gives you a sense of, of the important bits. Uh, it tells you that the liver's up there, and it's about that big and that colour, and then there's the stomach, and there are intestines and things. But it's not overburdened with unnecessary detail, as you can see. And it gives you a rather rudimentary sense of how things are laid out. The next thing is you go to university, and you start studying anatomy. Uh, and when I started, you, you, you had textbooks like this, and, and they're very beautiful, these pictures. They're, um, they, they're coloured, and they show that all the arteries are red, and all the nerves are yellow, and everything has a place. Now, you can't read those things, and nor should you, but they, they, they tell you that all these little cut-off nerves have a, a name. That is the vagus nerve and superior cervical cardiac branch of the vagus nerve. Who knows what that means? Um, well, I do a little bit, but, um, <laughs> but, but it, it gives you the sense that that is always there, and that if you opened a person up, you would always find exactly that in that place. You then go and you go to the dissecting room, and you start dissecting cadavers, dead, dead people who've given their bodies to science, and then you see something that at one level is a, is, is, looks a bit similar, um, but at another level doesn't. And so here we are, we've got the liver up there, we've got the intestines and things. But when we look in more detail, we see something completely different. We see something that uh, here is a picture in a book, like that last one. But actually, when you're doing it, it's something you touch, you engage with. You're doing it yourself. You're getting a sense of what these things are like in three dimensions. But you're only getting a sense of what they're like in three dimensions when they're dead. So this, that, that structure there that's sort of kidney-shaped, you won't be surprised to learn, is, is a kidney. Like um, this one over here, though, that just looks like a flattened balloon and says IVC. Um, the non-clinicians amongst you may not know that that stands for inferior vena cava, which is the largest 
vein in the body. It takes all the blood from the lower half of the body up to the heart. And as I discovered very quickly when starting to operate on patients with injuries there, a small hole in that will fill up somebody's abdominal cavity with blood faster than you can think. It is utterly terrifying. Woomph! And gallons of blood come up, but you get no sense of that at all from seeing that structure in a dissecting room. So then you come to put that into, to bring that to life, to do, to do operations. You're working with other people, you're working on a live patient, and then again, you find that there is another difference between what you learnt in textbooks and what you learnt in the dissecting room, which is that every single patient you operate on is slightly different. They've got the same overall pattern, but the details are all different. Nowadays, of course, um, much surgery is done in a different way altogether. It's done by keyhole surgery. So instead of uh, people clustered around a, uh, an operating table looking directly down into somebody's insides under anaesthetic through an incision, they're instead looking um, at a screen because the, uh, the surgeons are putting tiny cameras, tiny instruments through little holes uh, in, the, in the tummy wall and projecting those onto a screen. So nobody is actually directly with their own eyes seeing the patient's insides, but they are seeing a camera view of the insides. And again, it's very beautiful, it's very coordinated, people are working together. But what you see through this view is very different, because it's magnified. And because it's magnified, you see a view, all sorts of things get in the way that you didn't know about. Because when you look at something very close, you see that it's everything, all these structures, they're all surrounded by a bit like the bubble pack you get when you buy a wardrobe or something from Ikea. It doesn't tell you about that in the instruction manual, <laughs> but it's there. And it can be quite difficult. You have to learn a different way of seeing to make sense of what is packing material and what is an important artery, an important nerve, or an important something else. It's a different way of seeing, and you can only get that by doing it. It's the equivalent of you put your finger in there and feel the... Um, oh. <laughs> so two different ways of looking at the body, and here's... Uh, and, 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 but they're all very different. They're both very different from that oversimplified view that we started with. And nowadays, there's a completely different way of looking at the body, um, which is called interventional radiology, where, is it, where instead of um, opening somebody up or even looking at the inside uh, with cameras, you um, feed in a little wire under local anaesthetic, so the patient's awake, aware of what you're doing. You feed in a little wire and you feed it up, say, from the the groin or the elbow or somewhere, into the heart or the brain, and you do something. And when you do something, you're using imaging technology. You're not seeing things directly, you're seeing x-rays or scans. And so in one sense, you're far removed from the patient. Paradoxically, though, in another sense, you're much closer to the patient because the patient is awake while you're doing it, very often. And you're talking to them. Uh, but the image that you get is very different. So this is a, um, this is a sort of x-ray, it's a moving x-ray image you can see when you I can tell you that there's a, um, a bone a joint over there, it's a hip joint, and if you look up there at the top right, um, when I started you'll see a black wiggly line coming down there which is a, one, of those, one of those wires which is being um, led down through an artery, you can't see the artery, you can't see much else because it, only the wire shows up on x-ray, and it's coiling because it's there to stop some bleeding coming from a hole in that artery. So different relationship with those structures in the body. Not touching them directly, touching them indirectly. So that's a series of perspectives of what goes on in the operating theatre from an operating team's point of view. So let's look at what other perspectives might be. Now I said that I spent a lot of time in Africa dealing with people who'd been stabbed, people like this, who would come in uh, with a stab wound, and I'd be dealing with that, in this case, somebody with a stabbed heart had to operate very quickly, thinking about uh, what the problem was, not really thinking widely at that stage, thinking about saving this patient's life. But the patients who came in, um, they were often like this, they, they were kind of bemused, bewildered, often. They'd been stabbed, but they didn't really know why or what had happened. Sometimes they didn't even realise for a while that they'd been stabbed, and they had this very characteristic expression as they were looking down on, on where they'd been stabbed. Now, these last two um, are from an exhibition by Ron Muick, I don't know if you know his work, um, in central London a couple of years ago. And so here we are with an artist 
giving a different perspective on something that I had grown up with as a surgeon. Here's another artist. This is Barbara Hepworth, uh, 19, late 1940s, beginning of the health service. One of her triplets had serious bone disease, and she spent a lot of time in the operating theatre, watching what was going on, making drawings, making notes, and did this very beautiful series of pictures. This is one of them, in which I think you get a very clear sense of it being an operating theatre. You get a very clear sense of people giving their undivided attention to what they're doing. They're focused, they're calm. Uh, you see their eyes, you see the light. But if you look at it carefully, you, you don't see anything else. You don't see the patient. You certainly don't see the details of the operation. You see very few instruments. It's all about the people and the occasion. It's not about the details. But as a surgeon, I thought was the primary focus of surgery. And even in line, in line drawing, she does something, I think, very similar with the, with the extraordinary economy of line, and she still gets that sense of what everybody's there to do. So I want to, I want to propose to you that the current model of, of education, the one I learned at at school, in the dissecting room, in the operating theatre very often, um, was a schoolroom model pretty much like what I'm doing now, where I'm standing up there in that red box, and you're all sitting down in little chairs, and I'm telling you stuff that you didn't know, and I know it, and you don't, and soon you will, and that will be great, <laughs> I hope. Um, with all its inherent power structures and all the things that have been around for 200 years or more. And I'm going to propose a, a different model, not an alternative, but a, 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 as an adjunct, a, a, another way of looking at the world, which is to say that we all have different kinds of expertise. I have expertise that you probably don't in dealing with people who've been stabbed and shot and fixing them up very fast. But you've got different kinds of expertise. What it is to be a patient, perhaps, or looking after a patient, or all sorts of things. What it is to be students at Morley College and how that might feed in. And that a process of sharing different perspectives will enable us to see things differently from that schoolroom model of transmission. And that if we can do that effectively, we might be able to achieve something that my colleagues and I in our research group are thinking of as reciprocal illumination, a change in perspectives for everybody concerned. So I want to widen things out now and say, OK, if, if the world of surgery is of interest, how might we make it possible for people who don't have access to the originary world itself to see it? Because you can't just turn up off the street uh, and, and, and turn up in an operating theatre, see what's going on, and chat to people about it. I mean, probably none of us would want that to happen if it was our operation. Obvious reasons of confidentiality, infection control, security, all those things make that world, for all sorts of reasons, closed. But it might be possible to recreate, we've been arguing, something that gives a sense of this complex, highly technological, um, and hidden world in a way that's more like Barbara Hepworth's way where we can where we can extract essentials and we can take those out into view and so this um, this this operation that I showed you earlier um, of a surgeon operating on a stab patient wasn't a real operation it was a simulated operation it was taking place um, in in front of an audience quite a large audience at a science fair a couple of years ago in Cheltenham and so the audience who've never been, never been anywhere near an operating theatre, some of them dressed up in blue gowns and they're part of the team. Uh, and all the rest of them are watching. And they are seeing, not just, not just seeing as on television, but seeing and taking part in these processes of surgery with the, with the surgical team. Um, and it's taking place not in a hospital or a simulation centre or anything, but in a marquee um, out amongst the flower beds, just around the back of the town hall in Cheltenham. So, so this is raising interesting issues about how you can take the um, how you can take the, the sort of setting of surgery out to to show to other people. But what, what about the actual surgery itself? Now, for a long, long time, uh, medical schools have been using simulation of this kind to teach people, as in this group of nurses, how to, how to do a, a straightforward procedure, how to put in stitches in a wound, um, using these oblongs of latex. Now, they don't look really very much like any wound that 
I've ever seen on anybody because they're oblong and they're sitting on a table and they're pink and they don't bleed and they don't cry out and all sorts of things. Not very, um, not very realistic in many ways. And the reason they're not realistic, I think, is that they're, they're nothing to do with the person, they're an object. So a while ago, I had the idea that maybe if we took one of those very same skin pads and we just simply attached it to a real-life human being, a healthy person, and, and covered up the gap, we might be able to, to recreate a, a, a clinical encounter rather than a technical exercise. And it turned out to be surprisingly powerful, even though very very crude, apparently simple way of doing things. Um, and since then, we've been working with, with people, with experts from film and television prosthetics, um, to create things that, that look very realistic by sticking on things where you can't see the joint. So this looks like a wound, but it isn't. It's just stuck on. Um, this one, for instance. Uh, here's somebody closing a, a, a wound like that. Um, and you can see that you really have to look very carefully, if you can see it at all, to pick out the, the joint. And so unless you know, or even if you do know, your sort of starting point is that this seems like a real patient, and that triggers all sorts of ways um, of doing that, that you bring in when you're dealing with real patients. So something like that, to me, makes me immediately think uh, that this person's come off their bike and they've gone along the road and maybe some nerves are injured or whatever it might happen to be. Um, this, this child had, had the same sort of thing, nasty, nasty cut on the elbow, which is quite a difficult part to, to, heat, to stitch up sometimes really nasty looking things like this compound fracture, which if you just see it at a glance, or, or even, even if you're part of one of these simulations, you, you treat somebody like that as if they had a fracture. It's very difficult to touch them without thinking you're going to hurt them, even though it's just stuff on. So this is raising all sorts of interesting um, ideas, I think, about the extent to which it's possible to recreate not just a single episode, but say a sequence of events, something we're calling sequential simulation, where um, the consultant surgeon here is assessing, as we say clinically, working out what's wrong with, uh, with this patient who's got a stab wound. And then we see the operation, as I've shown you earlier. And then when he goes and sees the patient uh, a few days later, the wound is beginning to heal. Again, this is stuck on. But it seems very much like the kind of wound you would get after somebody had a major operation. So this, this makes me wonder well, what, what, what is surgery? It's beginning to look slightly different from what I used to think it was. I mean, is it a, is it a science? Or is it a, is it a performance? Because we've seen lots of, we talk about performing surgery, performing operations, and we've seen people performing there, haven't we? Is it a craft? Or, or is it perhaps, as I, I think it probably is, I think we could say it's a practice which combines all of those things. And if it combines all of those things, then this would be a good point to start thinking about how other scientists, other craftsmen, other, pra other performers might be able to connect with what we do, with those elements of surgery that are science, craft and performance. And I'm going to start by looking at craft. Uh, over there on the left is Joshua Byrne, who's a bespoke tailor, I'm calling from Saddle Road. Uh, and he's in a room with a group of master's students at the Masters in Education, in Surgical Education programme, which I lead at Imperial. It's been going for about 10 years. Um, and one of the things it's provided is an opportunity to explore areas that aren't commonly dealt with in medical education programmes. Ours is a surgical education programme. And so we've decided to look at, um, at some of these issues. Now, Joshua, uh, on the left there, is explaining how to do uh, several bits of his job as a cutting and a making tailor. So he's the person who deals with clients, works out what kind of a suit they want, designs it collaboratively with them, but also knows how to, how to make, how to put things together. And he's showing some of the tools, the instruments, the techniques that he's using. Now, I went to see him in his, uh, in his studio uh, a few months ago uh, and asked him just to, to show me some of the things that he, that he does. And so here he is. He's, he's putting together bits of um, cloth, obviously. He's, he's shaping, he's moulding, he's doing, with, with no apparent effort and with enormous skill and elegance, he's shaping material. So, when I first got to know him, the, the thing that struck me, first of all, was, of course, that, you know, say this, Say his toe. 
tailors sew and surgeons sew. And uh, I'm a surgeon and I've done a lot of sewing, so I thought, well, you know, he, he, he makes it look so easy, so, so how difficult can it be? Um, so I thought I'd, I'd ask him if I could have a go and, and ask him to let me know what, uh, what he thought. So, so I'm having a go now in his, in his studio. Oh, so I've got... We aren't drunk, either of us. It's the it's the um, it's the audio. I'm afraid that's uh, sleeping. Um, how about that? If we took that out, and, and I you just did that. Oh, so I've got three. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to go back and take it out. So, I mean, this was, this was really creepy for me because, uh, you know, in the course of 20 seconds I've made, what, 10 or so elementary errors that anybody who's ever done any needlework wouldn't dream of making. And I wondered, why, why is that? I mean, it's not as if I've never held a, a needle and thread. It's not as if I've never practiced and practiced and practiced for God knows how many years to do delicate, dexterous things with needles and threads. But I, I, I'm completely hopeless here. And I think what it is, is that it's about context. Because when I was saying things, I was... I was I was standing up with gloves on and a mask. I was under a bright light. Um, the thing didn't move around. Um, people would be handing me things without me having to ask or, or, or look at them or anything like that. And the whole context was completely different. I then go back to I go to, to Josh's place and I'm, I'm sitting down. I'm using a, a straight needle, not a curved needle. I've got a thimble, no gloves, no light, um, loads of bits of cloth, which is a material I'm not familiar with using. And so things that I had to take completely for granted and no longer realised that I was an expert in came into view by changing the lens through which I looked at it. So, so I've been thinking, you know, how might we, how might we explore that further? So this is the, this is the master's programme again, Joshua on the right, of course. On the left, one of the master's students, a gynaecologist and another craftsman in the middle, exploring through conversation what we might have in common. Now, the gynaecologists um, use instruments that are smaller than those ones um, on the table. The eye surgeons <laughs> use ones that are even smaller than those. But nonetheless, we're, we're familiar with, with using materials and with, with using instruments and tools to mould and shape materials. And then, um, about a year ago, I had a fascinating experience when I took my master's students over to Central St. Martin's um, at, uh, at King's Cross to join a ceramics workshop led by Duncan Hooson, who's in the audience here, um, and Julia Roundtree, also in the audience, to explore what the parallels might be between surgery and ceramics. So I took a group of about 12, I have to say, rather sceptical um, surgeons in training, most of them, over to Central St. Martins to meet um, a group of, I think, equally sceptical ceramic students. And, and first of all, we tried to teach the ceramic students how to put in sutures using those skin pads that I showed you earlier. And not surprising, really, they found it very difficult because it takes quite a long time to learn and we only had a, an hour. Um, they tried to teach us how to throw a pot and of course it was even worse because we had never done anything like that before. We were completely, completely incompetent. But then Duncan, first of all, demonstrated with the same fluidity and expertise that we saw in Joshua Bertha Taylor, how to make a, uh, a, a vase. But then, then he suggested that we might think, not in terms of individual techniques, but in terms of thin materials on the verge of collapse. And he showed us what happened when he thinned out the neck of a, of a vase to the point where it's so thin that it wouldn't support its own weight, it collapsed. And then we realised that we actually did have a lot in common because because as surgeons, to us that, you know, you're operating on somebody who's, who's 85 and the tissues are very thin, you've got to put in stitches and you're not sure if they're going to hold or not. And, and, and for the ceramic students, it's a similar sort of thing in ceramics. But we found we were speaking the same language when we were talking about how you know when it's not quite right yet, you've got to do a little bit more, but not too much or it'll crack, or it'll break, or it'll snap, or whatever it is. And that idea of a a way of looking at the world as different but equally expert in our own fields, craftsmen, 
led to a, a completely different kind of conversation. And we followed that up, we've done further things too. So here's a very brief clip uh, of a, um, an encounter which Duncan and I had upstairs at Morley College here a, a month or two ago. So, Roger, what interests you in what I'm doing? Well, as a, as a surgical educator, I'm, I'm always looking for, for ways of, of looking differently yeah. and helping people learn and, and teach about surgery. And operative surgery is particularly interesting. The work that we've just been doing here in, 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 the, in this pod has made me think of all sorts of parallels with, with surgery where I'm in with my hands and some material which in a lot of ways feels quite like human tissue. It's slimy, it's it moves around the body. And, and I got that, that sense of how thick the water is between my fingers. And that's something that I think that you understand as a craft yeah, that you can't get from books, you can't get from people telling you, you have to understand it for yourself. Yeah. <coughs> So, I mean, I, I hesitate to show this in front of, I'm sure there are many eminent potters here, but I hope you want to understand. But I think what we're talking about here, again, is the, you put your finger in there and feel the, um, that, that, that thing that you, that you can know that you can't say, that, that embodied knowledge, that tacit knowledge that all craftsmen have, but don't normally have a means of conveying to one another, because normally you don't have the opportunity to work with an expert ceramicist if you're a surgeon. You don't have an opportunity to work with expert surgeons if you're a ceramicist. So, so I think the, the idea of making connections of this kind is opening up new ways of looking at things. Surgery is craft. So let's look at surgery as performance then. Master's programme again. Um, but this time, uh, Stephen Gottlieb over there, who tragically died about two months ago actually, very distinguished luthier, a, a maker of lutes been doing it for decades, um, and he's, he's explaining to the MED students, the Masters in Education students, all of them surgeons, what is involved in making a lute. So we're seeing some lutes in progress there. Um, he's brought along bits of lute, bits of dead lute that haven't yet sort of um, come together, and he's showing us the materials and the instruments and the tools that he uses to create something whose purpose is not just to be looked at in a glass case in the V&A like the cufflinks that I showed you a little earlier, but to be played, to be performed upon. So Bill here is a lutenist, somebody who is a, or has been a professional lute player. Um, and and when, when an instrument like that is in the hands of someone like this, we get this kind of thing. This is a, um, this is a, a discussion event that we ran at the Cheltenham Music Festival about a year ago with, with uh, Bill the Lutonist and a Lutonist. So here's Bill playing Garland, many centuries old, written music, scored, he's, he's interpreting what has already been written. Here's the same bill, though, in another um, guise, playing electric guitar in a, in a folk rock band, where he's not playing from a piece of music. He's improvising. He's responding to what is going on in the moment. He's using a stringed instrument in a different way. He's switching genres. And so that led to very interesting discussions with the MED students about parallels between scored performance, improvised performance, and elective surgery and emergency surgery. So if I'm uh, doing an operation to remove somebody's kidney or something inside, um, there's, a, there's, a kind of, there's a kind of set of instructions. You, you pretty much know the steps that you're going to go through. Now, they, they may not be exactly like that, of course, and it turns out to be slightly different in every person, as I said earlier, but nonetheless, you've got a clear idea before you begin of the steps you're going to go through. If you operate on somebody who's fallen out of a tree uh, or been run over by a taxi or something like that, then you really don't know at all what you're going to find until you open them up. Well, once you find it, you know what to do with the bits of it. They've ruptured their spleen, you have to take it out. They've done a, this to that, you have to do that. And so you're then bringing into play things that you've already learnt. In the same way as Bill is bringing into play um, chords and harmonies and, and ways of playing that he has already learnt. But he's putting them together in a different way. He's putting them together in the moment which is rather different 
from when he's performing something that he's practiced like that piece of done. So that's one way of looking at that surgery. Another way um, that I found very interesting is to look at the movement of bodies in the operating theatre. So I'm going to show you a, a, a project that I worked on for a couple of years with the choreographer, Suba Subramaniam of Sadana Dance. Um, from a trance conversation we had, led to her coming to the operating theatre, the real operating theatre, and also taking part in our simulations to look with a dancer's eye at how bodies, how people move around. Because I started off talking about the, the, the ballet of hands, but of course there's a ballet also of people moving around in the operating theatre that as a surgeon you don't see because you're standing facing, let's say, facing the patient, looking only at there under your bright light with people handing you things. And there are loads of people moving around and you just don't even see them because you're focusing on what you're doing. So this is a, a brief clip of some, from some research work we were doing in, a, in, a, in a, an actual hospital operating theatre. It's this funny green colour because we've anonymised it so that you can't tell who the actual people are. But I want you to have a look once you get your eye in at the number of people that are moving around. So that's the, that's the operative team. They're looking at that red screen over there. But you can see these green shadowy things. And so every so often somebody comes across your field of view. And so if you, you imagine if you're standing on the edge of the operating theatre, you'd be seeing all these people, all this passage of people to and fro. Whereas if you were in the middle of the operating team, the scrub team itself, you probably wouldn't see that. <coughs> and so this led to a, um, a dance called Under My Skin, a 50-minute dance. I'm going to show you about a minute of it, which was a collaboration between... Um, between Suba, the, the choreographer, and her three dancers, and a poet, Alan Fisher, who had also come and spent time in our simulations, and created a poem that was prompted by that experience, not directly representing it, by, but prompting it. So we're going to see the dancers at the beginning of the, um, of the performance, alongside the poem that's being read out, and then just see where that leads, just for a minute or so. <laughs> So to me, that's a kind of dance equivalent of Barbara Hepworth's view. We're looking at people who are clearly dependent on one another. They're, they're moving, they're falling, they're catching one another, and they're doing these very precise movements with their hands, but these are not directly surgical movements. These are inspired by the movements of surgery, but they're filtered through a choreographer's lens, in this case of being brought up in the Bharatanatyam tradition of southern Indian dance forms, traditional forms, sort of um, melded with contemporary dance forms. So we're seeing a sort of transmutation of the world of surgery turning into something else by being looked at from a different point of view. So, so we've looked at surgery as surgery, we've looked at surgery as craft, we've looked at surgery as performance. And now I'm going to show you a couple of examples of performance of surgery in a different way. In a sense theatrical, in a sense not. And I'm going to take you to the Big Bang um, Science Fair at the, London, at the Birmingham NEC uh, a few months ago. Huge event, three days, 65,000 children and young people. Um, several zones, medical zone, and in the centre of the medical zone was our stand, quite big, 10 by 10 metres, in which we showed performances that we called Life on a Knife Edge. What happens when you get stabbed? 
We're going back to that theme of what happens when somebody is stabbed. But we're looking at it from a different point of view. And we're looking at it uh, with a, a large number of members of the public. And we're going to show you, I'm going to show you perhaps a minute and a half or something, again, that took 20 minutes or so. We're going to see this young man on the left and his friend on the right. He's, the one on the left has been stabbed. He's an actor. His mum, whom you'll see a bit later, is also an actor, but everybody else you see is what they appear to be. Policemen are really policemen, um, and so on. And here's what happened. So the first thing that happens is that the police have to come and have to check everything's okay, and then they call the ambulance. The ambulance have taken him into their ambulance, the paramedics have taken him into their ambulance. And now we ask everyone to fast forward half an hour or so, imagine he's been rushed into hospital, operating theatre has been got ready, and uh, the operation is about to begin. And we've invited some members of the public to take part in it. part of the operation, but, but um, Miss Laura Coates, who's the operating surgeon there, that's only part of her job. Obviously, when the patient wakes up, she needs to explain what's happened to him. And what's happened to him is that he actually needed to have a, a stoma, a colostomy, brought out. So the next bit, we're going to see her talking to him and his mum about what happened. Are you able to hear this at the back? Is it working with this? Yeah. Okay, so she, she's explained it. You have to bring out this thing. Um, and we did this lots of times, but then up towards the end, somebody from the audience um, came along and said, actually, well, look, I've had a stoma too. Would you like me to, to tell you about it? And, and, and then we're inviting the members of the public to come along and have a, have a go, really. Because, <laughs> I mean, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity, isn't it, to, to feel a liver or a, uh, a spleen or a kidney, if you haven't done that already. Um, so, so we're looking here at a series, I think, of interlocking perspectives. The, the medical perspective, the, 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 the surgical perspective of what it is to operate on somebody in the middle of a much bigger picture. What happens when somebody is stabbed in a school playground, police, paramedics, talking to the patient afterwards, rather, I think, like that Ron Muir picture of the man who'd been stabbed, who looked bewildered. I think patients are very often bewildered when they come round from some unexpected event to find that something life-changing has happened. Um, and so here's something else we did along similar lines. This is Haggerston Park in London, and that little, um, little Turco's minivan uh, has got a tent inside it, there it is on the right, where we've been showing people, a, a group of people from a school in London where knife injury is a particular problem, um, the operation, which I think they were quite interested in, but after all it's not what they do. But then when we got to the bit where the patient was having to explain to his mum what had happened, 
we got a completely different response because for, for, for these people, the thing that really that really worried them was what what would it be like? I mean, you know, you've got you've got this bag. Is it going to smell? What about having sex? Can I go swimming? What will I tell my girlfriend? How long? You know, all these questions which when we're focusing on saving somebody's life in the operating theatre, we don't necessarily think about, but which are actually the beginning of a much longer story for the patient once they've left hospital and we're dealing with the next one, that kind of thing uh, persists. So here's another example. This is brain surgery in public again. Um, and it's another, um, it's another science fair. So we're looking here at a, um, as a simulation of a patient who's, who's had a fall and, and damaged their head very severely. They, uh, they've been resuscitated by the helicopter emergency medical service, HEMS, and now they're just about to have a, uh, an operation to take out uh, a bit of the skull to relieve a blood clot underneath. What you do is you make three holes uh, in a triangle shape through the skull, and then you join them together with a sort of <laughs> kind of uh, electric sort, and you lift out a plate, and then you take out the blood clot. So, just go back there. So, so that's what we're about to see. And so that man over there is the he's a, uh, the the head of neurosurgery at St Mary's Hospital. Th this is not the head of neurosurgery. Isn't it? <laughs> um, in fact, it's the first time he's done a brain surgery operation. But, but he's having a go at experiencing what it's like to drill a hole in somebody's head. And it really is something, believe me, that you have to have done it. Uh, it's no good just seeing it on television. And, and again, there is the you put your finger in there and feel the um, part of it. So, so you, you 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 get the impression that this is something that only brain surgeons do. But 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 two fascinating things came out of this. One was that in the audience was um, a, a craftsman, a sculptor who works in 3D, of course. Uh, with materials ranging from, from wood to metal, to all sorts of things. And he said, he said, I don't understand why you make three holes and join them up. If I wanted to take that shape bit out of a piece of wood, I'd make one hole, and then I'd use the thing to go and just go straight around. Why do you make the three holes? Well, I don't really know, except that when I learned to do that, that's how it was done, so I learned to do it too. But I think it's a fair question to ask, because I think as surgeons, as probably as everybody, but as surgeons we, we, we work within a particular frame and we spend a lot of time thinking about doing things differently within the frame but we very seldom think to challenge the frame itself and so I think to me this was about challenging the frame, it was about asking different questions. The other thing we learned was that, um, well here is, a, here is another patient, over on the left is James Piercy, he's a sounds communicator this is another of our simulations. Now, James himself had an operation rather like this two years ago. He had a ghastly accident. He lost control of his car with the front wheel blowout, smashed into a tree. His wife was killed outright. He was airlifted to hospital in Cambridge. Doesn't remember anything about the operation at all because he's got post-traumatic amnesia for about six weeks. But he, here he is, he's, 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 he's talking about it. And interestingly, one of the effects of this was that all sorts of people came out of the audience afterwards uh, to talk to him and said, well, you know, I've had similar things like that in my family, but I never felt I could tell anybody about it. And so it opened up completely different conversations from the ones which are just about showing clinical procedures, interesting though those may be for a lot of people. So there's something about connecting through conversations, through sharing ideas, that I think is very, um, very important. Um, I just want to tell you about another project now, which was a programme that my colleague Aaron Williamson, who's Professor of Performance Science at the, at the Royal College of Music, and I did for a, what turned into a half-hour radio programme on BBC Radio 3 last year called The Scalpel and the Bow. That's Aaron, 
Um, and we decided to explore two different worlds. The world of a string quartet player and a surgical team through simulation. So we got a, 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 the surgeons to, to do an operation called carotid end arterectomy. You, you're operating on the big artery that goes from the, uh, from the heart to the brain, the carotid artery. It involves uh, opening it up and taking a bit out, but uh, taking out the stuff that's clogging up the inside. But it's done under local anaesthetic in case little bits break off and so that the surgeons know if the patient is showing signs of having difficulties with their speech or whatever. So the operation is technically difficult, it's very demanding, it's high stakes, you can't make mistakes. Um, and so the surgeon here is doing that operation, but you can see there are big microphones there, and this is all being recorded on sound. And then the next day, um, she went into the studio and listened again to the, opera, to, the, to the recording of her doing this operation and recorded over the top of it her kind of inner voice of what she was thinking about at the time. So in this clip, you'll hear some voices in the background. That's the anaesthetist talking to the patient to make sure she's okay. And then louder on top, you'll hear Alex describing what she's thinking. <laughs> And so she's talking about all the things that were going through her head, but she wasn't saying out loud at the time. So on the other side, we've got, uh, we've got the string quartets, and we're looking at each, an education of the cellist. And so here's Lyndon doing the same thing. He's had his uh, the performance recorded, and now he's in the studio saying what he thought about it. And then, and then Aaron, Williamson, and I went into the studio and spent several hours having a conversation about what came out that, that made us think differently about what we thought we already knew, but all sorts of things did. For instance, the whole idea of performance anxiety and performance nerves and what that does to performers of different kinds, how you sometimes have to improvise, how you have to communicate with people when you can't use words because either you're playing or you're operating, whatever, all sorts of things that we had neither of us thought of before doing this came out into view because of doing these um, simulations. Well, we're getting fairly near the end ourselves as well, but I wanted to just change track um, a little bit for the last part of this talk to, to say that um, certainly over my career, there have been huge changes medically between the kind of surgery that I was brought up doing, big holes, look at it directly, and keyhole surgery, say, for instance. Huge change within the lifetime of people um, now practicing, and so we've got a group of consultant surgeons coming out now who have never done an open gallbladder operation. They've done millions of gallbladder operations, but they've all been done through keyhole surgery. But they've never done it in the way that it used to be done only 20 or 30 years ago, raising interesting questions about what might they do if they needed to do it in that old way, say. And this is not a problem for surgery alone, of course not. Um, this is the the, the book resuscitation room, the book hospital, so to speak, of the, um, of the British Library. Lots of books at the British Library, of course, um, and many of them very valuable, needing to be repaired, restored. Uh, but a lot, of the, a lot of the skills, like doing the gold tooling on leather bindings, are dying. Because the people, the three people there who can do this, who spent decades learning to do that and only that, um, are about to retire. They're in their late 60s, early 70s. And fairly soon there will be nobody who has that level of expertise in doing that particular kind of craft. So I think it's a more general problem we see it. It's happening in photography, it's happening in printing, it's happening in pretty much everything you could think of naming. So I wanted to see whether we could capture, in a surgical sense, what elderly people might be able to show us. I thought it would be interesting to look at 1983, 
It's a time I know well because I was a trainee myself in 1983, and it was before keyhole surgery really came in in a big way in 1990 or thereabouts. Now, there's only so much you can get from photographs um, because of the, you put your finger in there and feel the... Mm. Um, so I thought it would be very interesting to talk to somebody who was very old. Florence Thomas is very old. She's 97. She was a, a theatre sister from 1932 to 1942 in London. In 1942, she got married to a serviceman. And in 1942, you could either be married or a nurse, but not both. So when she got married, she had to stop being a nurse. And she never did anything again ever to do with nursing. So 70 years ago or whatever. So I wasn't particularly surprised when I spoke to her and asked her to tell me to find out that she couldn't really remember much about what it was, well, much at all, to be a scrub nurse. And, and it's not surprising, she's 97. And, and, but then I, ha I happened to have an instrument in my pocket, one of those forceps, and I, I gave it to her and asked her uh, if it made her think of anything. You would have been dealing with instruments, wouldn't you? There is a pair of instruments. Does that, do you recognise that? I don't really remember them all that well. Uh, but it looks as if you've held an instrument like that before. Yes. Are those like the instruments you would hand to surgeons? Yes, you used to hand me. These were after a four steps, as far as I remember. So how would you hand that to a surgeon if he needed it? <laughs> and so for anyone who's been in an operating theatre, this is utterly characteristic of the way a scrub nurse will hand an instrument to a surgeon. And so 70 years later, Nothing to do with it, it's still there. And so there's something about objects triggering memory, I think, that's very interesting. I don't know if anyone recognises, this is the Science Museum's Reserve Collection and the V&A at Blythe House in Olympia, where they have an absolute treasure trove of extraordinary things. I went down there and the first thing I saw was this, which some of you in the audience may remember or recognise. I didn't until this moment. I hadn't thought about it for decades. But then it took me straight back to when I was a small child at the Clark's Shoe Shop in Baker Street, where my parents took me to get those start right shoes, and um, I loved it, because you stood on it, and then you looked down it, and you pressed a button on the side and x-rayed your feet, and you could see your toes wiggle, and see if the shoes were the right size. I mean, imagine it, health and safety. Um, <laughs> but it took me right back to, to what it smelled like and what it felt like at that time. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe we could use these instruments. And there are loads of them down there in the science museum, extraordinary collections of anaesthetic machines and surgical machines and things, to enact an operation. So this is Harold Ellis on the left. He's 87 now. Same Harold Ellis we saw in that film. His anaesthetist, Stanley Feldman at the top, same age, and Mary Neelan, much younger, but a nurse they worked with for many years at the Westminster Hospital. And here in the science museum's full-scale replica of an operating theatre from 1983, sorry, 1980, which has been like a fly in the amber ever since. It hasn't moved for 33 years, 34 years. Um, Full-size operating theatre. The Science Museum allowed us to take away some of this stuff and put different stuff in, and to put Harold Ellis and his team, um, rather like a sort of benefit concert for, for an extent of Led Zeppelin or something like that, um, to come together and to do an operation using surgical instruments from the time to, uh, to create a way of doing things that is now vanished. So I'm going to show you a brief clip, um, and here goes. Um, so you'll be relieved to know it's not a real patient on the operating table. It's a, it's a pig's liver and gallbladder in a silicon model. But I want you to look here at the space between the scrub nurse, Mary Neeland, and the professor who is focusing on what he's doing and talking to his assistant over there. But have a look at what goes on there with this nurse who appears to be paying no attention at all. In this case, the artery is running with it. In men, the artery is so difficult. In mankind, men and women, the artery runs so far it breaks into three pieces. Now, the artery runs so far that here you can see. You can see that the... And this is even more interesting if you slow it down because not only has she already got ready the instrument that she knows he's going to need, even though he doesn't quite know it himself yet. 
But if you slow it down, he puts out his hand. She puts the instrument into it. He takes his hand back, and then he says, "Scissors, please, sister." <laughs> after he's got it. <laughs> so, so it's a sort of instinctive, sort of automatic process that no, no one in that room had any awareness of. It just kind of happened, and it was only by showing them the video afterwards that they even knew that any of that had taken place. But have a look at these at these two assistants over here, because these two assistants. Here's the professor over there explaining to them after the operation what had happened and what they can learn from it. These two assistants would never have encountered him in real life because when he retired from clinical practice, became an anatomy professor in 1989, one of them was uh, nine and the other was ten. They were both in primary school. So the gap is too great. They could never have encountered him clinically. So I think there's a great deal that we can learn by, by alternative models of of learning that, that go away from the schoolroom model um, and, that, and that look much more at a, at a conversational, um, exploratory approach that acknowledges these different perspectives. And I'm going, to, um, I'm going to finish now with two things. One is a quotation that I particularly like from uh, a philosopher and craftsman himself, Richard Sennett, also at one stage a professional cellist who's talking about relationships. You may know this already, but if not, um, I think it's very apt. He's talking about the way of working in the early modern workshop, by which he means the Renaissance craft workshop, 15th century kind of thing. And he says, the precept ruling the early modern workshop was that informal, open-ended cooperation is how best to experience difference. Mm -hmm. Informal means that contacts between people of different skills or interests are rich when messy, weak when they become regulated, like boring meetings run strictly on formal rules of order. Open-ended means that you, can, you want to find out what another person is about without knowing where it will lead. Put another way, you want to avoid the iron rule of utility that establishes a fixed goal in advance. And cooperation is the simplest and most important term of all. You suppose that different parties all gain by exchanging, rather than one party gaining at the expense of others. And to me, this sums up what, I'm, what, I'm, what I think is most important, really. And I'm going to leave you with a, a piece of work in progress at the moment. This is a, um, a project that we're doing with, with, the, uh, with people from the Art Workers Guild. I don't know if you know the Art Workers Guild. It's in Queen Square. It was set up at about the same time as Morley College, about 120 years ago. One of its early masters was William Morris, uh, and it has, I think, 65 different crafts are represented there. All of them are excellent in their field. They're all leaders in their field. And we went over there, showed them a simulation a while ago of putting some bits of intestine together where you have lots of bits of thread. I hadn't seen, I'd just seen it as putting a bit of intestine together. But one of the lace makers there said, ah, this is thread management. We always have to deal with thread management, otherwise my students get their threads tangled up. So rather like the thin materials on the verge of collapse, we got together a group of three kinds of surgeons, paediatric surgeon, heart surgeon, vascular surgeon, with a, a, some puppeteers, a lace maker, a, um, a, a textile knitter, and a, somebody who uh, does computer modeling of threads, and a fisherman. And here we are, just having um, a couple of minutes of what went on when we first met about three weeks ago. We're going to meet again in a month's time. We don't know yet what will come out of it, but here's where we've got to so far.
I started to think, with the others in the group, about what it might mean to think, not in terms of a specific procedure, but more in terms of an idea, uh, as a means of bringing into view things that perhaps for us had become invisible. We had a, a, an interesting series of discussions around things that might be parallel between surgery and other crafts in terms of thread management. What thread management is, is, is the joining of disparate ideas. It's to do with something that seems to be vanishing from the world, which is a very intense engagement with the properties of material. We're all using materials and it matters to us these micro measurements of difference. After a given amount of experience, those, those tiny differences become vital. Okay, so I want to finish by saying that, that I've been looking in different directions. So like Jane is here, looking forward, looking backward, looking ahead, looking behind. And I think by doing that, by, by making connections between surgery, between learning, between individuals and between the society that we all live in, making connections between the sciences and the arts, and making connections between performance and craft, then I think we may be able to, to move towards that reciprocal illumination that I think is a, is a hallmark of the values of, of, of Morley College, certainly, of reaching outwards, of looking to what other people do, to, 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 to striving towards what Richard Sennett was talking about, about the, the, the spirit of the early uh, modern workshop, of exploration, of curiosity, and of valuing other people's points of view. But not only Morley College, to me, this is the essence of what a truly humane and outward-looking vision of education should really be. Thank you.